take a look at our um, upcoming calendar for March, which will be posted very shortly. It'll be on our uh, public media meeting section of our uh, website. Uh, as a preview, uh, we will be spending a bulk of our time next month reviewing the FY24 hospital budget guidance. So um, the board will be uh, putting a lot of time into that with staff. You'll be hearing from Sarah Lindbergh quite a bit more next month as well. Um, I also wanted to announce a couple of public comments. Uh, after today's meeting, we will be posting a public comment on the FY 2017 UVMMC enforcement action. Uh, as, as I said, we'll discuss it today. We'll keep a public comment uh, period open until March 8th, where we have a potential vote scheduled. Um, both Sarah Lindbergh and Russ McCracken will give you more details as they get into their presentation shortly. I'll also remind you, as I do every week, that we are accepting ongoing public comment on a next potential all-payer model. Um, any comments we receive, we share with the Agency of Human Services and the Governor's Office, as they, they are leading the current model work, as well as the potential next model negotiations. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much. Um, before turning to Ms. Lindbergh for the UVM um, Medical Center Enforcement Action, we'll take up the meeting minutes from February 8th, 2022. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes from February 8th? I'll move approval. Second. Is there any board discussion? Hearing none, um, those in favor of approval of the minutes from February 8th, please say aye. 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 And the vote is unanimous. I'll turn it to uh, Sarah Lindbergh. Ms. Lindbergh. Good afternoon. Uh, Sarah Lindbergh, Director of Health Systems Finance, and I'm joined with uh, Russ McCracken, Staff Attorney, and Russ will actually be the one to talk with you first this morning. I meant afternoon, sorry. Uh, great, thank you all. Um, <clears throat> Russ McCracken, Staff Attorney with the Board. Uh, I should be seeing my screen. Could you make sure you see that? All right, great. Uh, so <clears throat> before we get started, I do want to just make clear at the outset the um, some uh, I guess a couple of housekeeping points. There's no vote today. Uh, the board is not taking any action today. There was no vote noticed for today. Um, that was done intentionally. Uh, we have a potential vote notice for March 8th, but um, because of our format, we wanted to get the discussion started. So we're presenting that um, for you uh, today. As Susan mentioned, we're also opening a public comment period that will run uh, until March 8th or maybe the day before so that we have uh, time to make sure the board can see all uh, public comments that come in about this. There is some. Uh, motion language in the slide that's for completeness uh, and for you to kind of see but um, you know no no motions uh, on this issue of, are going to come up today. Um, so I, I'm going to give a little bit of background and history um, uh, as best I can as an overview of this FY17 enforcement action particularly for uh, board members who are new to it or who weren't, you know, weren't here over the summer when we discussed this in the context of hospital budget reviews. Uh, so most recently, uh, UVM Health Network sent the board a letter. Uh, it was at the beginning of February, near the beginning of February, um, giving us the current status of the self-restricted funds, which initially were 21 million. Uh, it's now at about $18 million. Uh, UVM Health Network reports that the 18 million uh, is still in self-restricted funds it, for its intended use to address the mental health needs, the inpatient mental health capacity, and uh, they welcome conversations with the state to consider the best use of the funds. Um, that letter also goes through to talk about some of the other in mental health uh, initiatives that uh, UVM Health Network hospitals are doing um, in the state. 
Um, let me hit our uh, staff recommendations here and then I'll, I'll go back and do a little bit of the history. <clears throat> what we're going to recommend is that the board uh, make a, a, mod a slight modification to the FY17 enforcement action so that the self-restricted funds can be used to support uh, an increase in capacity and mental health services in the state without it being limited to inpatient mental health beds. The initial order permitted UVM Health Network to self-restrict those funds uh, as long as they materially increased um, the inpatient mental health beds in the state. We're suggesting that those funds could be more beneficial and more immediately used for the state if that restriction were broadened to include uh, mental health capacity beyond inpatient beds. So uh, the second part of our suggested approach here is that we require UVM Health Network to develop uh, a proposal in consultation with the Vermont Department of Mental Health that outlines the planned use of the remaining funds to address the mental health needs in Vermont and submit that to the board by May 31st. <clears throat> um, here's a bit of the historical timeline. This action is it from fiscal year 2017. <laughs> the enforcement was deliberated and voted on um, back in March of 2018. Um, I'll go through the specifics of that action on the next slide, but part of it was to require quarterly updates uh, on the status of mental health project from UVM Health Network to the board. Um, those updates took place from 2018 through uh, really through 2020 on a quarterly basis, and then they were suspended for COVID um, and the updates became less frequent. In April of 2022, uh, the Health Network came before the board um, told the board that the project was not financially viable and that they were not at this point in time able to move forward on it. Uh, in June, the board sent a letter asking the hospital, asking UVM Health Network to consider some broader alternatives, um, including but not limited to um, adolescent or youth inpatient uh, facilities and also uh, giving the health network notice that not sufficient progress was being made on uh, the meant on the um, project to increase mental health uh, inpatient capacity. Um, during the summer and then into the hospital budget deliberations in the fall, the board looked at these funds again and considered whether this was possibly appropriate uh, to apply these funds to reduce uh, commercial rate increases. The board did not order that during the hospital budget deliberations. The board did cite these funds as one potential path that UVMMC could pursue um, to make up a a reduction in the commercial rate um, increase that uh, between what UVM MC had submitted and what the board had approved for FY23. Um, that process would require the hospital coming back before the board and asking uh, for the board to order the, those funds to be used uh, for commercial rate, um, uh, which has not happened in which UVM Health Network said in their letter they did not intend to do at this point. <clears throat> uh, so going back to the FY17 enforcement action, this is the text of the motion that was um, ultimately approved by the board following deliberations. Uh, the board provisionally allowed UVMMC to self-restrict $21 million in surplus funds 
with the condition that those funds be used solely for investments that measurably increase inpatient mental health capacity in Vermont. The order then required quarterly reporting. Uh, the enforcement action then went on to say that UVM has to continue to report quarterly until either sufficient progress is made on the plan that reporting was no longer needed, or that UVM Health Network had failed to make sufficient progress on the plan <clears throat> um, or under the second prong of that uh, part of the uh, order at this point. And finally, the order said if the board determines that insufficient progress has been made, it may order that UVMMC use all or a portion of the $21 million to benefit ratepayers through a commercial rate reduction. And I think it is important to take that bit in context of the board's hospital budget rule, which does set out a process for review of a hospital's budget, uh, re review of a hospital's actual results against its approved budget and sets out some guidelines for how the board may um, adjust a hospital's budget if its actual results are vary from the approved budget. That would be um, at the request of a hospital. Um, the rule gives a couple of options. One of them is changing the hospital rates or prices by the amount that revenues exceed the budgeted net revenues. Um, another option is changing revenues or expenditures of future budgets. Uh, there are a couple of other items here. The last one is a broad catch-all that covers any other circumstances the board deems appropriate. But I think that it's um, we see the tie-in between that budget rule and um, the idea that the 21 million, if not used for a project to benefit mental health capacity, gets returned to ratepayers through a commercial rate reduction. And just to be clear, the if a hospital is operating under a <clears throat> approved budget but not in compliance with that budget, and the hospital fails to seek an amendment, the board does have broader enforcement authority to go to court and require the hospital to comply with a uh, rule or statute. Um, All right. So, Sarah, well, do you yeah. want to jump in on this? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, so just so you know, some of the thinking behind our, our recommendation is that um, the need for mental health resources, not only in Vermont, but um, probably globally, have only increased since 2018. Uh, as have expenses associated with um, capital projects. So this um, kind of uh, this funding is at risk of kind of being of less value the longer time goes on. Um, and it also allows um, the opportunity for it to potentially be used um, in conjunction with other uh, fund sources or projects um, with by making it a little bit more flexible. And by involving um, our partners at the Department of Mental Health, we think that it gives us an opportunity to kind of balance and triage all of the substantial need so that we can try to maximize the return on these funds for Vermonters. And so uh, turning to the next slide, this is just a very high level indicator of the increased need, looking at the um, unfortunate increase in deaths uh, by suicide, both in pure, pure rate uh, and pure number of suicides, but also the rate of, in, of suicide. Um, this is through October of 2021. Um, we also know that um, folks are showing up in greater numbers to emergency departments, um, which is not an ideal uh, care setting for those problems, and that they are spending uh, a lot of time there that doesn't feel uh, beneficial to the system or to the individuals who need help. So uh, I, I know my own life has plenty of examples of uh, the unfortunate deterioration of mental health. Um, I think most of us have things to point to, unfortunately. So I, I think that's pretty um, well established. And just at a very high level, again, the next slide um, shows uh, the increase in the producer price index. 
uh, in the industry of uh, new healthcare building construction. Um, you can see that huge jump um, from 2021 to 2022 um, in those material costs. So again, as um, construction projects um, become more expensive due to supply chain constraints and other inflationary expense growth, um, again, you know, it might not get the most bang for those bucks uh, by building something per se. Um, and so here, as Russ mentioned on the next slide, uh, what we have is just a, a potential motion for you to consider. There will be no vote today, but um, this is the language that we had come with, up with. Um, as we'll point out in the next slide, uh, we do have a special comment period devoted to this, um, as well as a potential vote will be noticed for March 8th. But if you want to click back to the suggested motion for a moment, please, Russ. Um, I can just uh, practice my reading skills by saying uh, move to modify the uh, your UVM MC fiscal year 14 enforcement action to permit the self-restricted funds to be used to increase capacity of mental health services in the state not limited to inpatient capacity and require the University of Vermont Health Network to develop a proposal in consultation with the Vermont Department of Health for planned use of those funds and submit the proposal to the GMCB by May 31st, 2023. So again, just for you to kind of mull, uh, but I think at this time we're happy to um, answer any questions you might have about the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. McCracken and Ms. Lindbergh very much for the overview and um, the history. Um, I had a couple quick questions um, before I turn it to the other board members. Um, first, though, I want to commend UVM for indicating that this money could be earmarked and used for mental health and recognizing you know, the acute need for mental health that we have here. Um, given the history, I know there had been some discussion about using it for budget gaps or margin. Um, I want to thank UVM for recognizing uh, the importance of uh, addressing the mental health issues that we have here. Um, I, there's a couple questions I had, though, that will help me in voting. Um, and one is, as I understand it, it was UVM MC that originally had the $21 million of unbudgeted revenue, right? It was the medical center. Is that correct? Yeah, we were trying to reconstruct some of that um, history as well. Um, Russ, do you want to speak to it uh, in a way that a lawyer might understand better than I would? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, like Sarah said, I, we were trying to reconstruct the history. The um, motion language from 2017 refers to actual performances at University of Vermont Health Networks, Vermont hospitals, plural. Um, the actual restricted funds were uh, University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, and and I don't I don't know if that was simply because it's the, the largest of the three hospitals by a wide margin or if there was something else specific to it. I, I couldn't um, run down all the details on that. It was University of Health, University of Vermont Health Network uh, that was given the task of providing the regular updates and kind of leading the project, um, you know, potential mental health. Um, inpatient project. Okay. And, yeah, and so historically, enforcement would follow a hospital. So I think while technically a UVMMC action, it, it was intended to address the network. Okay. So a little clarity on where the funds came from, where they went to, and where they were held, I think would be helpful. And what I'm getting at is from the history as I understand it, which might be off. It was mostly, or it was UVMMC that had the extra revenue, but then the health network undertook the planning for the project to be at CVMC. And my question is really was where was the $21 million held? Was that the medical centers days cash on hand? The Correct. network somewhere? The was medical med center, yep. And the other question I had was, you know, the money's been held for a while and is there any um, investment in the uh, fund in which it was held is there any investment return that vermonters should see in connection with the money that was there for four or five years and if so what is it 
Yeah, um, so the way that the order was written, it was, you know, an amount certain and that uh, the order was to self-restrict it and it was self-restricted in their cash on hand, um, in their, uh, you know, unrestricted board designated assets. And that's where it's been uh, this whole time. And so it, you know, it's above, you know, below that kind of level of booking for our regulatory purposes, uh, we would just have to ask UVM for more detail. That might be useful to know. Um, the only other question I had was, is there any way to salvage anything from the $3 million investment in planning for the CVMC facility, or is that at this point a sunk cost? Um, we want to make sure this money is used efficiently, and that might mean something in Burlington or something in Middlebury or something somewhere else. Um, but I guess I'd like to understand if there is anything we can salvage from the three million dollar investment, and maybe the answer is that wouldn't be feasible because you'd have uh, it wouldn't be the right way to use the money, and it's just a sunk cost at this point. But that would be something to be useful to understand. Um, I, I have nothing else, so I'll turn it to any other board members. I just wanted to jump in and say um, I really like the collaboration with the Department of Mental Health. I think that will um, bring in the state expertise in terms of what the greatest needs are potentially right now around mental health. Um, so I think that's a really good addition. So thanks for thinking of that. I guess I'll just add to that and just say that I hope that inpatient isn't completely off the table and that maybe in conversations with DMH, um, you know, part of the issue I understand was the viability with the with the CVMC project was reimbursements. And so to the extent that DMH is involved and can see and understand and think about the viability of that project, you know, to, to Owen's point about, you know, is anything salvageable? I'm just still holding out that you know we know that inpatient beds is a still a need i recognize that there may be other more pressing uh uses of the money that will return investment sooner and uh, we have a mental health crisis and so you know perhaps there are better more immediate uses of those funds but i guess i'm hoping that it's not completely off the table um if i can i'll i just want to jump in i think that's a great point and i i wanted to confirm that the proposal that staff is offering um, certainly does not um, limit the use of those funds for inpatient capacity. It, it expands the potential use of it, but inpatient mental health capacity is, uh, certainly remains a, a, a possible use of the funds. If I could just build on to that for a second. Um, I too have concerns about um, I hope we don't let go of building in inpatient capacity. Um, the fact that our emergency departments are clogged with people needing mental health care services, sometimes residing in the, in the emergency department for weeks at a time, tells us there's a desperate need for inpatient services. They are in the hospital <laughs> in the hospital in the highest cost possible setting. Um, as we speak. But so I want to thank UVM. I want to join the chair and other members in thanking UVM for um, thinking about this. I, and I appreciate the collaboration with the Department of Mental Health and um, and the expansion of our thinking about how can we best use this. I think those are all good things. Um, I want to follow up briefly on uh, Chair Foster's question about where has the money been? And what is there any way to recoup the um, three million that's pre, that's been um, already spent? Um, I'm interested in learning more about where the money's been. If it had been, um, if it's been invested, which is common in hospitals, that um, days cash on hand or other dollars, um, if not days cash on hand, money is invested. That's an important part of a nonprofit hospital's financial. Um, strategy. If $18 million had been invested in 2017 or 2018, 
and receive just a 3% return that would have made over $3 million. So it's likely that the 21 is still possible if we want to um, pursue that line of thinking. Um, I'm concerned with the proposal. Um, I, this has been ongoing since most of us have been on the board. Um, enforcement, when there's been no action, has been lacking. And I'm not sure that, well, I'd like to see more thinking um, by us and our colleagues on what enforcement mechanisms we would pursue if progress is not sufficient in the very near future. This process started in 2017, 2018, and nothing has happened. So I think we- I just have to push back a little bit on that, Tom, because there, there were reports that came in that showed a lot of planning activities that did happen between 2018 and 2022. And I think for those of us who were here, we felt like there was progress being made. It, it did take time because there was, you know, there's a lot of desire for mental health advocates to be involved in the process, which I personally think is a good thing. And, um, you know, I think that having that community involvement was important, but also time consuming. Um, and we did not until 2022 post pandemic find that there was insufficient progress being made. So it's true there's no result, but this kind of project is, you know, takes years to plan and implement as well. So I, I just take a little bit of umbrage at your, your statement, because I think in my, I don't agree. And I was here. I, I, I welcome the, the conversation, Robin. Thank you. Um, we do disagree, but that's okay. Um, I would prefer to see, um, stronger enforcement language going forward. So we don't have several more years go by where we consider a submission of a report sufficient progress. Uh, I think just to respond to that, that um, I think that, uh, you know, as I get acclimated to this new role, I think that enforcement is one of the key pieces in rethinking our regulatory process. And it's it's not an easy puzzle to solve. Um, but I think, um, you know, taking actuals and applying them, you know, two years past the violation probably is not an ideal way to um, regulate. And so that that's on, you know, my punch list <laughs> for the next 20 years. Uh, no, it'll be sooner than that. But uh, the other point um, just about the value of those dollars today is that um, th there may be investment gains, but also, you know, the value of a dollar um, in 2017 versus 2023 has also changed. So, you know, I think those um, there's different forces kind of working toward uh, that. So I, I think it's, um, you know, probably not a straightforward answer uh, of what that money is today. And I think the other thing is that we didn't, re re you know, it wasn't segregated in a specific fund. It was just required to be self-restricted in the cash on hand. So um, I don't know that there's like a specific $18 million left that they could necessarily point to, but we will um, make the inquiry and I'm sure they'll in good faith um, present their best estimate of uh, your questions. Any other board questions or comment? I think the only, the only thing I'd add to this is that I, you know, I, I do really appreciate the idea of moving this to not being just brick and mortar oriented. I think we have a need as everyone has expressed and, and uh, we all experience and I, I experience in my clinical work and, and anything that we can do to increase access for mental health services in the state, I think is anything we do to promote that, I think is a, is a great thing. So I appreciate UVM. Um, UVM's willingness to engage in this, and I, um, I, I think this is a good step forward. Sarah Russ, would you mind going back to the suggested motion language real quick for me? Thank you. Okay. 
Um, I'll turn it to the healthcare advocate. Awesome. You might hear some, we're doing some parental changing of our child in a second. So that's some sound in the background. Apologies. Um, the healthcare advocates supportive of the recommendation and uh, the motion before you. I, I just want a brief comment and many of the questions and really questions that we had have been asked by board members and board staff. So thank you for the uh, good thoughtful conversation. Um, but one comment just to consider would be adding something to this motion about consulting a community mental health provider and, and or a community member slash patient um, as a part of this consultation process, because I think that that would provide a really valuable input. And I'm aware that, you know, we don't want too many cooks in the kitchen, uh, but I think perspective from those stakeholders would be really valuable for such an important project. So thank you. Thank you for that comment. That's a good that's a good recommendation. Um, we'll, we can talk about that. Um, and with that, I'll open it up to public comment. Please use the raise your hand function. I'll call on the order in which I see them go up, if any. The hands clapping from uh, Mr. Walter Hello. Carpenters. Is that uh, you, Walter? <laughs> that's me. Hey, I'm clapping. <laughs> Standing ovation, right, Owen? You know, Walter, it's a good thing that's one of the only uh, emojis or whatever they're called that we have available to the uh, public commenters, I think. <laughs> well, hey, standing all right. I just, agree, you know, I agree just to back up the enforcement is the key and I back up your question earlier wondering where that money was before all this. That's it. Thank you for for raising your hand and participating Walter. Um, any other public comments? Um, Mr. Rick Vincent, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, since I'm on, I thought I might answer the uh, one of the questions that that came up about the the ability to reuse that three million dollar investment that we made. Um, so largely, that planning work that's been done and all the the detailed work um, in terms of projections of patients and those types of things and just how big of a facility might be needed is should largely be able to be reused. Um, it just may be that the facility may not be located on the, the CBMC campus so that the money that has been spent um, uh, certainly uh, certainly can be used. Great. Mr. Vincent, just for the others, I think I saw your name on the letter just to identify you. You're the executive vice president and CFO at the um, Health Network. So thank you for raising your hand and, and answering that. Thanks for being here. Any other public comment? Great, um, Ms. Lindbergh and Mr. McCracken, thank you very much for your work on this. Um, next, we will turn to Vital and a potential vote relating to their budget amendment. And today we'll hear from Jessica Mendizable, who is our Director of Data Management, Analysis and Data Integrity here at the board. And we also have with us uh, Maureen Gilbert, who's the Director of Client Engagement at Vital, and Ms. Beth Anderson, the President and CEO of Vital. Um, I'm Jessica Mendizable. I just wanted to hop on. I'll be speaking after Vital's presentation today. So uh, Beth and Maureen, I just wanted to let you know uh, when you're ready, if you would want to go ahead and share your slides. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to start us off, but Maureen and I will um, share this presentation today. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to present again today. Uh, today's presentation has just a couple of topics for you. Um, one is the 
Good Mountain Care Board team has asked us to do a high-level overview of the HIE and some of the work that we do, which Maureen will kick off in a moment. Um, I think the highlight of today's meeting is our request for your consideration of our amendment to our current fiscal year, fiscal year 23 budget, which I'll walk you through. Uh, and then we'll present some highlights from our quarterly report that we present to you. Um, just to acknowledge on the call today, in addition to Maureen, our Director of Client Engagement, and myself, you have Bob Turnell, our CFO, Sue Fritz, our Director of Technology, and Christina Choquette, who is our Director of Operations. So we will together answer any questions you have or try to answer any questions you have. Um, so to kick it off, I'm going to turn it over to Maureen to um, walk us through a little bit of the HIE. Hi there. Um, Maureen Gilbert. Director of Client Engagement at Vital. I'm going to get us started um, way back at the beginning with a few abbreviations. We know that one of the um, unfortunate realities of health IT is the number of acronyms that end up in so many of our presentations. And so we are going to first try and avoid doing that. And second, uh, tell you in advance about the ones that we will use today. So um, to get started, Vital, um, we actually talk about ourselves as vital, think of that as our name, but it is um, short for Vermont Information Technology Leaders. And if we say VHI, what we mean is the Vermont Health Information Exchange. We've got a number of partners and programs that um, we also may refer to um, by their, their acronyms. So the Vermont Agency of Human Services, AHS, the Department of Vermont Health Access, DIVA, and VDH for the Vermont Department of Health. Beth will take us through our finances and um, we'll sometimes you'll see CY for calendar year, FY for fiscal year, and MO when we couldn't fit maintenance and operations in to talk about our maintenance and operations budget. So as Beth said, um, we were encouraged to do a brief overview of Vital and we'll keep this short recognizing that many of you have, have heard this before, but it's always great to ground the conversation in um, a little bit of background about what we do. So Vital is an independent nonprofit organization founded in 2005, and we operate the Vermont Health Information Exchange in accordance with um, Vermont statute. We have a board of directors, independent board of directors representing hospitals, healthcare providers, health technologists, payers, and businesses around Vermont. One thing that I would encourage um, everybody to do is take a look at our annual report. Our 2022 annual report takes a look back at some of the achievements from the past year and um, has a few notes about what's ahead as well. That report is available on vital.net and um, linked in this report as well, which I believe is on the Green Mountain Care Board website. So thinking about the work that Vital does and how the Vermont Health Information Exchange works, um, it's not just about moving data back and forth. Um, we, we do a lot of work to that data to make it usable, to make it meaningful in um, healthcare and in health reform. So we collect data from contributors, and I'll show you a slide next that shows who is contributing data to VITAL. We match that data, so taking all the records that um, exist for patients all over the state and bringing them together so we, we know um, a patient's longitudinal health history and it's made up of all the many places they've received care in their life. And then we standardize that patient data, taking it and translating it from all the, the local languages and local conventions that exist in the electronic health records of our data contributors and making it um, standard so that it can be used comparatively across the population. For our data contributors, we're a hub for efficient data sharing. What we do is we um, enable them to connect to us and then we send their data downstream to many um, of the places they need it to go. So instead of building multiple connections, um, data contributors are building one connection to us, which is more efficient. And then we're able to send the data downstream for purposes of um, public health, um, patient care, number of uses, which I will get into uh, in just a second. Really at the foundation of all of this for us is protecting patient data through robust security practices and ensuring appropriate access. That, that is at the heart of everything we do. Um, this doesn't work without trust and it's something that we are, are committed to. Ultimately, this data that we take in and we match and we standardize is sent downstream to um, inform patient care 
quality improvement activities, healthcare reform initiatives, public health activities, population health, um, and case management and care coordination. So our data contributors, we have um, a wide range of data contributors from all over Vermont um, and a, a border hospital as well. Um, all 16 or all the hospitals in Vermont contribute data um, as do all of the federally qualified health centers. We've also got good coverage with independent specialty and primary care practices, although more than twice as many um, independent specialty and primary care practices are accessing data as are contributing data. Um, we've got recently um, increased coverage with pharmacy chains and with labs during the pandemic really ramped up to bring in vaccination data from pharmacy chains and test data from labs. Um, and I won't go through the entire rest of this uh, contributors list, but it is available on our website and in this report as well. So importantly, how we're funded, um, as we're about to talk about our budget amendment, um, the majority of our current funding comes from a contract with the Department of Vermont Health Access within the Agency of Human Services. And we have sort of two funding streams within that. One is maintenance and operations funding, which supports the ongoing operation of the Vermont Health Information Exchange. And then there's design development and installation funding, and that supports the implementation of new functionality and capabilities. So state health information exchange priorities and funding, those investments that the state makes, are guided by the Health Information Exchange Steering Committee. And that's a multi-stakeholder group convened by the, the State of Vermont Agency of Human Services. And they document their priorities in a five-year health information exchange strategic plan, which is improved annually um, in November here by the Green Mountain Care Board. So that's the, the quick overview of of who we are at VITAL and what we do and how we're funded. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Beth to talk about our budget amendment. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this is an update, I'm so sorry, to our current year, our current fiscal year budget, which you did review and approve in June of last year. And our fiscal year goes to, from July 1st through June 30th of this year. And the changes reflect really two things, um, or and the the reason for re reforecasting the budget really is driven from our signing a new contract with the Department of Vermont Health Access for our January through June work. Traditionally, we've worked on a calendar year contract with the state, which is then uh, sometimes has makes changes to our fiscal year budget because it's a mid year where that goes into effect. Um, so this forecast will reflect the new items in that contract, as well as just our experience over the past six months of the fiscal year. So it's a more accurate reflection of where we expect we'll end up. Um, so next slide, please, Maureen. Overall, there's not a very significant impact to our budget. We are um, projecting that net assets will be, will be about $1,300 higher than we thought they would be in June when we did our budget. Overall revenues are increasing by about 543,000 and expenses by about 541,000. Um, so just to give you a little, I'm sorry, next slide please, a little context on the revenue changes. They're largely driven by new contract work we have. Um, so uh, one piece is extending the funding for the by state for the Vermont Rural Health Alliance um, to do some data quality and quality improvement work. Um, so there's 280,000 in revenue for that. You'll see on the next slide, there's an offset of, re of expenses where that goes to them to do the work. Um, we've expanded um, the monies available for us to build um, bi-directional connections for healthcare organizations to the immunization registry. So we've been working with the Department of Health on a pilot whereby uh, healthcare organizations can, um, through their EHR, their electronic health record, actually access immunization data on the patient that might be in front of them. And we are looking to expand that out to more, um, more healthcare organizations over the coming year. Um, we have some work to work with the designated mental health agencies to aggregate um, what's called 42 CFR Part 2 data, which is really um, substance use data, which has different protections and privacy required around it. 
And we've been working with AHS and the DAs to um, find ways to aggregate their data in. So it is available for some purposes. And then with the ultimate goal, though this will be a longer term goal of making the data available or what data is appropriately available um, for different needs of different providers to support their patients. And finally, there's a, um, another increase is we shifted some revenue we thought we would recognize in 22, but based upon the way the projects ended the year, we're gonna recognize some of that revenue in 23. We also have a decrease in what we had projected in our budget for this year of m and um, of about $470,000 lower than projected, which is offset by some lower expenses, which will take us to the next slide, please. There's some key changes in the expenses. And really the changes in expenses are aligned to the projects and the changes I just talked to you about. So we increased outside support to complete the projects and also fill some vacancies that we have open um, or positions we have vacant right now. Um, we have some specific project expenses outside the outside support to support those projects. As I mentioned, the monies to um, fund the VRHA in doing the, the quality improvement work. Um, we have some additional costs we've included for recruiting and training. We do have some open positions. Um, and we also do know that our staff, um, our existing staff and some of the new staff will need some, some training, particularly as we've implemented the, the new platform over the past um, couple of years to get some uh, advanced skills and some of the new technologies we're using internally. And finally, um, for the increases, we have some unfulfilled contract costs. So that's some costs that we incurred last year, but the revenue is going to be collected this year. So it's kind of just an accounting thing. Well, we will um, have additional expenses recognized in this year. And then some decreases in expenses to offset some of those increases. Um, we are with staffing lower than budget due to some vacancies. Um, we as I mentioned, have some decreased maintenance costs um, based upon some project timing, and we've decreased the contingency line in the contract. Now that we're further through a fiscal year, we you know which just leaves um, we don't expect to need the same kind of room for things to change or shift. And so those are the big changes that kind of feed into that thirteen hundred dollar change in our overall budget for the year. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions now if it's easier or at the end. So, um, I think it's fine if we go all the way through to the end and members can hold their questions. That's fine. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'll give it back to Maureen to Great. review our quarterly update. Thank you. So um, we do a quarterly update for, to the Green Mountain Care Board in alignment with our um, budget guidance. And that document is available on the Green Mountain Care Board website. It's um, a little bit more robust than um, what's in the remainder of the slides here. But we were encouraged to focus on two areas. One is patient education, and the other is our quarterly metrics. So just know there's more information available should you need it. Um, but we will go right into um, patient education. So VITAL is continuing um, its direct outreach to Vermonters through recurring education campaigns. So we've talked in the past about our commitment to um, educating Vermonters about their how their data is shared and about their options regarding that sharing. Um, so we do direct outreach. Last campaign was June through September 2022, and we're planning the next iteration for this summer. We also ask participating organizations, data contributors, and organizations that access data to partner in an ongoing way in educating their patients about how their data is shared. So in order to do that, we have a toolkit of education resources we make available um, to the participating organizations, and we encourage them to use that um, in many different um, uh, engagements with them. So onboarding when we're doing check-ins with the organizations, and we also do periodic outreach email campaigns to participating organizations, encouraging them to use that toolkit and also offering our services to help them um, if there's anything else they need to support patient education about data sharing. So our quarterly metrics are just a few snapshots of um, data about how data is accessed, how much data is accessed, who it's accessed by in the Vermont Health Information Exchange. Going to start by talking about the percentage of Vermont patients opted out of the Vermont Health Information Exchange. Um, today, um, and, and our quarterly metrics go through the end of 2022, uh, that rate is at 1.1% of all of the records in the Vermont Health Information Exchange are opted out. 
Vital access queries. So this is our um, clinical portal. This is the web-based portal where um, providers and staff can go in and um, look up patients' records one by one um, and find information to support uh, healthcare um, operations and so forth. And you can see here um, some distribution across a number of different types of organizations. We have many different um, types of organizations using this service. So ranges from um, strong use at hospitals and independent practices to um, the Vermont Department of Health, a lot of public health use in there and um, emergency medical services too. So ambulance um, crews are using this as well in their work. Um, so some interesting distribution of usage. And vital access queries by month. So what do I mean by queries? Queries are um, a chart access, um, whether it happens through a search or we have a few organizations that sign on directly from their electronic health record and they can go right from the patient in their electronic health record into vital access. However, they get into that patient's record, if they, that is, that is one chart access and we count it up to one time per hour. So um, our chart accesses are holding um, steady right now. It does look like there's a, a drop from 2022, but there was really big use around COVID um, by the Vermont Department of Health specifically. And when you take that use out, you see um, sort of strong, um, steady use of this tool with a little bit of growth. Queries of the Vermont Health Information Exchange from eHealth Exchange. So eHealth Exchange is a um, national data sharing network. Uh, initially, um, before we switched platforms, we were connected directly to the University of Vermont Medical Center and to the VADOD through point-to-point um, -point connections on the eHealth Exchange. Um, they were using this regularly to pull data. When we switched platforms, there was a need to rebuild um, with eHealth Exchange because they no longer permit point-to-point -point connections and um, only allow connection through what's called a hub model. And we are putting that functionality in place um, right now. So results delivery is an interesting service that we offer in that it um, is used by a really large number of providers in the state of Vermont, but almost none of them know that they're using it. So this is where we take um, lab results, radiology reports, and um, transcribed reports, so uh, notes, and deliver them to the ordering provider right in their electronic health record. Um, and this avoids you know, phone and fax-based workflows. It's much more efficient than the alternatives. And we have 586 um, providers currently receiving results directly in their electronic health records. To a large degree, and we'll see now the results delivery by the receiving organization type, th this is federally qualified health centers and independent pra practices who we're supporting by delivering the results into their electronic health records. But I think it's also worth remembering that this is a supportive service for the organizations that are, are sending the results as well. So for the hospital labs that are, are sending the results. So that's a quick snapshot of our, our metrics over the course of the last quarter of 2022. And I will stop there and see if there are any questions. Um, Ms. Mendisville, did you want us to ask questions first or are you presenting as well? And would you, if so, do you prefer to go before the board? Uh, I, d I don't have a preference, so. Um, why don't you go ahead? That'd be fine. Okay, sure, thanks. Um, let's pull up my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So uh, again, I'm Jessica Mendisable. I'm a member of the data and analytics team here, and I'll be presenting the staff uh, recommendation today. Uh, prior to providing the recommendation, I just wanted to walk through some background in uh, the board's role in vitals budget review. So um, as part of its oversight and policymaking activities related to the health information exchange, the board is required to review and approve vitals budget annually, as well as any amendments. And so this authority came to the board in 2015 and was first exercised in 2016. And the board's oversight is intended to provide 
strategic guidance and policy parameters. Uh, as Beth mentioned, um, the board did vote uh, and unanimously to approve VITAL's current budget. So as required by the guidance today, um, VITAL presented their budget update because there was a change that exceeded the threshold as specified in the guidance. Our legal counsel recommended that the board vote on the modified budget so that there wasn't any uncertainty about whether VITAL is operating under an approved budget by the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, so GMCB staff have reviewed VITAL's, VITAL's budget amendment uh, for FY23 as modified um, and agree that it continues to comply with the four principles that are stated in the guidance, and those are transparency, um, incorporating public and stakeholder comment, alignment with the health information exchange plan, and alignment with the VITAL and uh, DIVA process. Um, in addition, um, VITAL uh, uh, will continue to comply with the conditions that were included in the FY23 budget order. Those are going to remain unchanged. All other aspects of the budget approval would also remain unchanged. So um, I just want to mention that at the end of this presentation, those conditions that were included in the budget order are in a reference slide. Um, Um, so, um, just regarding public and stakeholder engagement, we did hold a public comment period. It began on Monday, February 13th, and it went through noon today. Um, we did not receive any public comments related to the budget amendment. And um, we have some proposed motion language, um, which we can revisit uh, after questions but um, it's, it's here for your consideration to move to approve the amendment to VITAL's FY 2023 budget as it was presented today. So uh, we can go ahead and go back to uh, discussion. Great, thank you. Welcome. And congrats, Ms. Gilbert and Ms. Anderson on receiving no public comment. That is a rarity here, so good, good job. <laughs> Others are gonna want your secret. Um, I'll turn to the board for a couple questions. I have a couple real quick ones. I went through some of the financial statements and I'm new to the board and the vital process. So um, I just want a little bit of background. Um, on the financial statement that was submitted with the 23 budget amendment, it said collections for fiscal year 22 audited financials was 10.8 million and disbursements were 9.1 million. And then there was a line for starting cash for the fiscal year 23 approved budget, which was about $5.1 million. That's that's sort of similar to like days cash on hand. That's just cash that's held at Vital. Is that right? Bob, do you want to take this one? Do you want me to? I'm trying to get to um, that, but um, let me just get to the special conditions. I believe that you're correct in your uh, assumption. So what I, you know, the collections versus the disbursements is runs pretty close in your budgets from what I can see, right? Like there's not a lot of excess revenue above costs. So I had a question about how the cash position came to be uh, around the $5 million level. It's an accumulation of the change in net assets over uh, the past, oh, four or five years. There's been some years where we did have some funds at the end of the year um, in surplus more than we had anticipated. And what we've tried to do um, now that we have built up um, uh, what I would say is a sound amount of our uh, 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 amount of um, cash on hand so we can cover our, our shifts and um, 
costs and when the revenue comes in relative to the expenses because the expenses are more consistent month to month. The revenue comes in a little bit more um, at peaks and valleys um, as we complete deliverables. Um, but what we've started to do is use some of the funds. Um, you can see last year was an example where we did um, have a higher surplus than we had anticipated. And the budget that was approved in June by the board, we reinvested, or we are reinvesting some of those monies this year into the platform to enhance some efficiencies and capabilities in the platform. So we're trying to find the right balance of having enough cash to kind of weather the ups and downs and, and be prepared for those, um, and then reinvest where we can to, to put them to good for the HIE. Is there sort of a target level that you've concluded is sort of where you wanna be in terms of cash on hand? Great question. It's a conversation we're actually working through with our board um, now with the finance committee of our board to get put a formal policy in place. But, you know, Bob, I think we've really aimed to have six to nine months um, feels like a comfortable place. Again, given given what we know about how there can be variation in, in the, the receipts. I'd done some rough math last night. I thought it was about twenty nine thousand dollars per day based on the number uh, I'll mess this up. Sorry, you can scratch that question. Um, okay. And that's so, pretty close, um, yeah. Chair um, Owen. I mean, Chair Foster, that's pretty close to around the usage of, of cash. Okay. So. And we have an open CFO position if you're interested. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Bob would like to retire. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, are there any sort of benchmarks or comparisons or guidelines that the board should look at in the future, not for this particular isolated thing, but in terms of what it costs to run um, an HIE uh, of this size and scale? Yeah, that's an interesting question. The, the, there's not a good benchmark, and I'm not trying to be cagey, and uh, you know, I know the, the state is looking to try to do some benchmarking against other HIEs, but because each HIE is so very different in each state, right, and has been built to meet state state or community needs, so they're not all state run, some of them are more regional. Um, there's not one that I could say, look at that one, and that's a great comparison. We, um, some only move data and don't house it. Some only get certain data types and don't work through it. Some really just serve more as a provider portal and that's it and don't do some of the reporting and the kind of digging into the data that we do to make it available for some of our stakeholders for more robust reporting. Um, so I think there are ways we can, um, and, and, and this this work with the, that the states are planning on taking on will give us some good guidelines, but I don't think there's a definitive answer about what that looks like. But we do participate in a, um, sorry, this is a long answer, but we do participate in a national collab collaborative of HIEs. It's called Civitas, where we do do have these conversations across HIEs. So we share org charts. We share how we do our work to at least help us understand how, how we're doing or where we can learn to do things better or differently, more effectively and efficiently. So um, it's maybe some more informal ways of doing it, but we do try across the board because we're all largely nonprofits um, working with our states with public funds and trying to be good stewards of those funds and deliver as much as we can. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, what you all do do is quite different depending on the HIE. Um, okay, and so in this year's budget, there will be minimal contribution towards the cash on hand, and I presume that's because of just where your expenses lie and that you have a sufficient cash position. It did strike me as kind of large for a five million dollar cash position on revenue of nine or ten or eleven million dollars, right? I mean, half the revenue is held in cash is is just jumped out to me as potentially significant. Um, okay, I, I had no other questions. I appreciate those those answers. Thank you. Um, I'll turn Thank it you. to any other board members. I had a quick question about the immunization uh, directory work that you're doing. Um, could you just give us a sense of how many organizations were participating in the pilot and how many you're hoping to expand it to? I'll answer if anyone wants to help me, feel free. But we have one in the pilot. Um, we have, a, uh, I think, 10 that VDH has on their kind of 
next list to start to try to work with. And then I think the population is just limited by the number of healthcare organizations in the state that will want that access. So. Thank you. Um, and the other question I had around the DA, uh, the work you're doing with the DAs around the part two data. Um, what kind, I'm just curious since obviously until you work out the longer term issue and the, the federal regulatory issues around um, sharing the specific data, um, what kind of uses are you anticipating the aggregated data would be available for? So this is to support and uh, I don't know all, I don't, I'm not, I don't have all of the specific details. So I'll share what, um, what, what I know um, is this, the state uh, as a funder, right? So um, as a funder of some of this work really through, um, through their partnership would like to work with the DAs to do some, uh, to understand better the services, right? So the goal is to really be able to combine the part two data that they, they hold with the, I'm going to say the other clinical data that we have in the HIE and really join it together to get a more robust picture of the kind of patient and population health. So I think the, the goal in the, the more near term is to have that more complete picture of those patients for some of their work. Great, that, thank you. It sounds uh, like it's largely uh, state driven and the or AHS driven and uh, that they would be the user of that data. Yes, yes, and hopefully. Yes, yeah, hopefully the DAs will be able to get some better analytics too on their patients by pulling it together. Great, thank you. The only uh, comment that I have to add on, on this, I support the budget amendment, but is that I, I and I, we've had these conversations and I just want to continue to, to uh, encourage um, whatever provider usage we can of this data, it seems, uh, of, of the of the user interface, it seems like an incredibly useful resource for Vermonters and providers in Vermont. And uh, just um, I'd love to see those numbers grow and more utilization. I, I do. I think this has come up in other conversations too. I do uh, think that at least several of us at the board would love to see. Um, one of the various organizations that works with large groups of providers, be it uh, ACO or um, or you all, uh, have a provider-faced dashboard for patient-oriented metrics. Um, and I, I know that's a step away from what you have been doing so far, but it just is something. It it just seems like when you look at the utilization by independent providers and FQHCs for laboratory data and results. It's it's almost like the perfect place to have some aggregated information in there for providers. But again, um, scope creep for this discussion, and um, I, I appreciate the work you do and you uh, coming here today to present the budget amendment. Great, okay, and it's um, it's an idea that we definitely are we have on our roadmap. So we will, we will talk more. Okay, unless there's any other board questions or comment, I will turn it over to Healthcare Advocate for any questions or comments they may have. Sure, we we don't have um, a position on the budget amendment. Um, I do want to say for historical context, um, and it deserves to be recognized, the HCA was very critical a few years ago about the match rate of records and VITAL has substantially improved that. And I think it's a very good example of demonstrated success that we should hold everyone to. Um, and as board members who have been on for longer know, we took a position different from the board and from VITAL for opt-in or opt-out of the system. Um, obviously a different direction was the parties decided to go towards opt out. Um, but I think Vital did a, a very good job of explaining that to consumers. And although I would imagine our position on it hasn't changed about the harm, the risks of um, an opt out system, I would say all of our concerns um, were addressed by Vital, and I think they did a wonderful um, public education campaign. Thank you. 
Mr. Fultai, thank you very much for your comment and in, in recognizing um, the improvement that you saw. I think that's important to do, so thanks for doing it. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to public comment. Okay, um, seeing none. Um, Ms. Bendisable, would you mind pulling up the suggested motion language again? Sure. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll move to approve the amendment to VITAL's fiscal year 2023 budget as presented today to the GMCB. Um, I'll second. I'll second. Is there any um, board comment or discussion on the motion? And all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Gilbert, Ms. Anderson, and Ms. Mendisable for your presentation today. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, I think that is all we have on the agenda today. Uh, is there any new business? Any old business? Ms. Barrett, did I make any mistakes? Okay, all right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. I guess everybody else wants to stay. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor, I don't, so I'll say aye. <laughs> aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice day.